Let the day perish wherein I was born and the night in which it was said, there is a man-child conceived. Let that day be darkness. Let not God regard it from above, neither let the light shine upon it. Let darkness and the shadow of death stain it. Let a cloud dwell upon it. Let the blackness of the day terrify it. Four and a half years after the body of Dr. Robert Ogo, Kenya's Minister of Foreign Affairs, was found near his Koro farm, the only person ever to be charged with his murder, District Commissioner Jonah Nguka, was acquitted on the 29th of July 1994 by Mr. Justice Agananyana in the High Court. With Nguka's acquittal, the search for who killed Ogo and why they did it might have ended. The story could have been consigned to the list of Kenya's high profile unsolved murders. But startling new information and allegations came to light. The Oka murder story kept on changing. In April 1992, an article appeared in Britain's weekly newspaper, The Sunday Times. In it, one George Wajakoya, who claimed to have been a special branch inspector at the time of Oka's murder, alleged that Oka had been picked up from Koru by Hezekiah Yugi and Nicholas Biwat in a white Mercedes. They were supposedly backed up by two cars full of armored men. Wajakoya claimed that Ayugi had broken Ouko's ankle. He was then driven 90 miles to one of Moy's homes, beaten, shot by Nicholas Biwot in front of President Moy, and his body dumped at Gotalila two days later. Wajakoya's story is provably untrue. Uh, eyewitness testimony, forensic evidence prove beyond doubt that Robert Oku was shot where his body was found on the morning of the 13th of February 1990. He wasn't shot at State House or anywhere else and his body dumped two days later. But Wajakoy's story was significant. Uh, it became the widely believed shot at State House theory. Uh, it formed the basis of Anguka's book Absolute Power and indeed may have influenced his trial. And it was taken up in large measure by the Parliamentary Select Committee over their hearings during 2004 and 2005. In December 2002, after 24 years in power, Daniel Arap Moy stood down as Kenya's head of state. He was replaced by Moy Kibaki. Just four months later, a Parliamentary Select Committee under the chairmanship of Eric Gorsungu Sungu began work to investigate and report on the circumstances leading to the death of the late minister. That, in my opinion, is going to give evidence. Was this to be the diligent and impartial inquiry Troon had called for? The Parliamentary Select Committee's lack of impartiality was evidenced from the outset um, by the speech made by its chairman, Gor Sungu, when he moved the motion to set up the PSC on the 19th of March 2003 in the House of Assembly. Upon his return from the national prayer breakfast, like a dog, the late Dr. Uko was sent packing to his home. His bodyguards were dismissed. He was left a lonely man. Note, the PSC's chairman made these comments before the PSC had sat in one session, before they'd heard one piece of testimony, and before they'd seen any evidence. Even to disagree with this story was to be labelled not a witness of truth by the select committee. This is a very serious matter, and you as a learned gentleman... So, so what, I, what I tell him, that, that, did, that did not happen as you are telling me. What happened is, is this, and I explained to him what really happened. I don't know where you got that information, but I was there in Washington, and I'm telling you what I saw, what I had, because I was there. And he would then call me a hostile witness. <laughs> Even at the time, some of those involved in the select committee hearings began to have doubts about the way it was being handled. We are not job, we are not on record. I agreed to be a member because there was unfinished business about the assassination of Ooko. But over time, I came to the conclusion that our chairman 
and the Honorable Korsung was out of his breath in chairing a committee of this nature. Gorsungu was also criticized for not allowing the cross-examination of some witnesses. The final straw came when this lady, Martin, was summoned to come and give evidence, which was going to implicate Nicholas B. Watt adversely. Surely, the lawyers for Nicholas B. Watt should have been permitted to cross-examine uh, uh, the lady. But no, he straight away uh, blocks and rules that uh, he will not allow the lawyers for Nicholas B. Ward to cross-examine by the witness. But when she came to give testimony to the PSC, the change in Brian Matten's testimony bordered on the bizarre. Brian Matten now alleged that Dr. Oko may have been murdered because he knew dark secrets about President Moy's private life. In particular, that he was being supplied with Ugandan prostitutes for his pleasure, and that Oko was intending to use it as a last weapon. The Ugandan girls, which was organized and kept at the disposal of the former president, they were kept after arrival in Kenya under isolation until their visit to State House was confirmed. Dr. Uko also knew about them like other insiders. He told me once about the rumors. Now, when we wrote the book, she presented a case of uh, prostitutes in Mombasa being the reason for which the minister was murdered. And so I started wondering, I mean, how did the prostitutes become the key reason in our book? Whereas in Nairobi, it was a very different thing she was talking about. Bryna Matten's change of testimony didn't end there. She went on to make another sensational claim that she had had an intimate relationship with President Moy. I had a relationship with that man once. I do not know if you understand this. If you once loved somebody, you will believe in him. You have to realize that you may have loved the wrong man. So, why did Brian Matten suddenly and dramatically change her testimony? The answer is that she had to. In preparation for the PSC hearings, Nicholas Biwott had engaged the services of a London firm of investigators, the Risk Advisory Group, TRAG. TRAG found court judgments, company records, minutes of meetings, official files, President Bush's official diary, and Oka's correspondence. They also reviewed witness testimony. That report has been in the public domain since 2005. Since that time, not one fact in it has ever been faulted or seriously challenged. The TRAG report destroyed Bryna Matten's Kisumu Molasses corruption story and the Washington trip theory. Of course, it was submitted to the select committee. Some on the committee must have read at least the summary. Bryna Matten changed her story because she knew the game was up. Too many people by then knew the truth. There must be some Kenyans who are proceeding on the basis that if Mr. Muita is there and he's a lawyer, he will see to it that, that certain things are achieved. And, and since I was not being effective, I thought really I had no choice but to resign, and I resigned. There are many ways of killing a cat. And I don't want to go into the details because now these are the polit political forum. Kor Songu himself, I think, completely mismanaged it. He went out to look for glory. He went out to nail, to try and nail uh, Nicholas B. Watt. Um, instead of looking for evidence, I think he decided this is a person he must nail, nail. And that is how he conducted himself. And at the end of the day, it was a, a, a big disgrace. And uh, I don't feel written, everything was written more or less. I wanted to present it to the committee. And then after that, they'll cross-examine me, but they refused. They said they don't, they will not uh, entertain that. Now, Mr. Bewot, I am inclined now to rule you out of order and rule that we must proceed as we have been proceeding. I will not entertain any further questions. If you want to withdraw, you can withdraw. If you refuse... I said, please let me present my side of the story and then question me. But they said no. So I pleaded with them, they said, you are intimidating them. 
Mr. Chairman. Mr. Mr. Please, Mr. Please, Mr. Please, Mr. Please, Mr. Actually, who, who, gives, who gives a permission for people to talk here? It is the chairman. Right now, the chair has ruled, and I believe I'm right, and we must proceed. If you will not, if you will insist on interceding any further, I'm going to adjourn this proceeding. Read, read to the to order. Read I think, it now, I think so that everybody will know exactly I what I read. Now, I think what members no, now, now because, we have we have talked about these proceedings. Yes. We because, will now adjourn these proceedings because, because that was only. I think the proceedings are adjourned. That was only an introductory. If you read it, I had not even begun giving my evidence, and it will continue. You're shutting me out. So I insisted, and I stood my ground. So they got fed up and they went and left. And with that, the Parliamentary Select Committee's investigation came to an end. During the Select Committee proceedings, five members of the committee resigned and four others moved on to other appointments. They were replaced. But of the final ten members of the committee, four did not sign the committee's report. The search for the truth as to who killed Robert Oko and why did not end with the Parliamentary Select Committee's investigation. Kenya's hotly disputed presidential election of December 2007 sparked a wave of violent protests. Over 1,400 people died and hundreds of thousands were forced to flee their homes. In the aftermath, Kenya's parliament set up the Truth, Justice and Reconciliation Commission, the TJRC, to investigate human rights abuses in the country since independence including the murder of Dr. Robert Ooko. The TGRC's report into Ooko's murder was published in May 2013, but it was still based on Troon's final report, which had been delivered 23 years earlier. But the TGRC's conclusions did not take the search for the truth much further. Based on the limited information available before the commission, we are unable to shed any light on the identity of Ooko's killers. Like Troon, the TGRC calls for further investigations, but as we've seen, the Commission did manage to come to one entirely provable conclusion. In addition, the Washington trip theory revolves around a private meeting with President Bush and Ooko that never actually occurred. But how was this crucially important finding that there was no meeting between President Bush and Dr. Ooko delivered to the Kenyan public the next day? The front page of the Daily Nation reported the exact opposite. Dr. Aouko was killed not long after a U.S. trip in which he had audience with President Bush, but President Moy was left out. How did it come to this? 22 and a half years after Aouko's murder, after two police investigations, three inquiries and two trials, no light could be shed on who killed him and why. And where the truth was known, it was often ignored, and where it was revealed, it was often misreported. From the moment Oko's body was found, rumors spread like wildfire. Oko was killed when I was studying in Canada. And among the Kenyans who were in York University, you know, we, we met that night. And they all seemed to know who killed Oko, you know, how it happened. Uh, and and th that was a day after. Gossip and speculation quickly hardened into theories that came to be believed. This is a previously unpublished confidential telex. It was sent from the US Embassy in Nairobi and reports a meeting between an embassy official and an unnamed Kenyan male. This meeting took place on Wednesday, 21st February 1990, five days after Uka's body was found. The lunchtime conversation was taken up almost exclusively with theories on the biggest story since the Kalenjin took power, the apparent murder of Foreign Minister Dr. Robert Ouko. And out come the theories, none of them backed by any facts or evidence uh, that Robert Ouko had done well in Washington and uh, was seen as a threat, that uh, he was fleeing to Uganda and that maybe he was shot elsewhere and his body dumped at Gotha Leela, all of which are provably untrue. But note all these three theories were passed on to the police and have been repeated to this day. Kenyans wanted to believe that Biwot killed Oko, because that was the, uh, the, the narrative about this murder. 
so 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 when you have that kind of situation uh nobody wants to get justice nobody wants the truth but there's possibly a more sinister element to the diplomats briefing of which this is just one of several from the time. Was it just gossip or malicious politics? Or did Oko's killer or killers get their story in early and discreetly to misdirect the investigations? Could the name of Oko's murderer lie in these telexes? For more than a quarter of a century, the Oko murder story has been clouded by baseless rumor, dishonest testimony, and naive misunderstanding. The myths surrounding his death have been repeated so often that they are now seen as established fact. Foremost among these was that Oka was a threat to Moy, to Buwat, to Saitoti, to a yogi. He wasn't. Dr. Robert Oko was a Kanu man. He was Moy's man. He served at the highest level of state, Minister of Foreign Affairs under Moy. Moy brought him back into frontline politics. Minister of Industry, and again pointed to Minister of Foreign Affairs, the spokesman for Moy's Kanu regime. Nor would Oku have challenged any of the big beasts, for example, about corruption. Uh, what? Oku write a corruption report naming Saitoti, Buwat, a yogi, the president himself. Didn't happen. Then, there is a question of the so-called mysterious deaths. This is going to be one of the hardest things for Kenyans, and particularly Kenyan journalists, to accept. The idea that dozens of witnesses in the Yoko case have died mysteriously is a myth. It was the PSC that first came up with the mysterious deaths stories. More than a hundred key witnesses linked to the unresolved murder have also died in the past 15 years. 100 mysterious deaths of key witnesses. In fact, the PSC report listed just 18. The teenage herds boy, Paul Shukuku, who initially found Dr. Uka's burning body, was said to have mysteriously disappeared straight after he told the police what he had seen. In fact, he gave testimony a year later to the Commission of Inquiry and was positively identified by his former employer as being alive several years later. The PSE's list also included the British pathologist Dr. Ian West, but he died of cancer in a UK hospital in 2001, 11 years after Uka's murder. This is no mystery. And the TGRC bizarrely added to the list. In early January 2012, 22 years after Uka's murder, his maid, Selina Were, died aged 68. Her brother told the press she had died after an on and off illness due to old age, and the family pleaded for the media not to report Selina's death as mysterious. But lo and behold, despite this fact and the family's pleas, the TGRC added her to the list of so-called mysterious deaths. It's utter nonsense. Uh, I've personally interviewed at least three people who were reportedly dead. And then there's the slight matter that the vast majority of the people involved with the story of Oku's murder are still alive. For example, of the 15 people in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs from the time that I would want to question, 12 are still alive 27 years later. In his final report, Troon called for diligent and impartial further investigations. They were to rule out any lingering doubts experienced at that time. The further investigations conducted for this series have, we hope, been diligent and impartial. But they come to very different conclusions from those suggested by Troon. We have been able to dismiss the Washington trip and Kisumu Mulas's corruption theories as motives for Oko's murder. But what of the individuals named in Troon's report? In reverse order, Troon's report adversely mentioned local Kasumi politician Joab Aminu, the permanent secretary in the Ministry of Internal Affairs Hezekiah Yogi, and Energy Minister Nicholas Biwot. So if Joab Aminu is in the dock, guilty or not guilty? Troon ruled out local politics and local corruption, I think wrongly, as possible motives for Oku's murder. But if Troon was right, then that to some extent, exonerates Joab Amino. Troon included 
Aminu in his report because he said he didn't have a sufficient alibi for the day of Oku's murder. That matter was never resolved. So at the very least, the case is not proven, or if you could say, the jury's still out. Hezekiah Yugi, guilty or not guilty? Troon didn't offer a motive as to why a yogi would kill Dr. Robert Oku. He included yogi in his report because he'd been evasive in interview and almost certainly withheld evidence. And Troon was no doubt influenced by the fact that a yogi was greatly feared. There's no doubt that he was. Nicholas Biwat, guilty or not guilty? Nicholas Biwat, Troon's favourite suspect. Biwat's alibi was that he was at a rally in Moranga with the president, some six hours drive from the murder scene, which we know was at Gotalila, near Koro, nowhere else. There are numerous photographs of Biwat at the rally, and thousands of people would have seen him there. And we have shown beyond any doubt that, contrary to popular belief, Biwat had no motive. The motives that Troon gives for Biwat's possible involvement in the murder, the Washington trip and Kasumu molasses corruption theories have been totally disproved. And all of the evidence is against them. Nor would Oku have in any way been a threat to Biwat. It may be a hard truth for many Kenyans to swallow, but Nicholas Biwat is clearly innocent of any involvement in the murder of Dr. Robert Ooku. Later, especially during the Parliamentary Select Committee hearings, President Moy was mentioned as a suspect in the Ooku murder. Could the president have ordered the executive killing of his Minister of Foreign Affairs? Moy had no motive. Ooku was his man. He was unwaveringly loyal. He was doing a good job for his president and he was certainly no threat to Moy. And it's not Moy's modus operandi. He sacked ministers. He may even put them in prison if it suited his agenda, but he didn't kill them. And Moy immediately calls in New Scotland Yard to investigate Ooku's murder. This is not a process he would have been able to control. He wouldn't have taken that very risky step if he himself was behind the murder of the minister. Sam Okello wrote two books on Robert Ooku's murder. In them, he pointed the finger of suspicion at President Moy and Nicholas Biwat, but later he was to disclaim his earlier theories publicly. Okello tells of an intriguing conversation he had with Christabel, Robert Ooku's widow. She looked at me for a while. She's, uh, she's got eyes that uh, can be penetrating. And she told me, young man, you know what happened was uh, the things you have in the book, The Night Bob Died, are uh, mostly fiction. The gentlemen who may have murdered my husband are not the ones you say murdered him. Our investigations suggest that almost certainly one or more of his murderers are still alive. But could they be prosecuted today? Could a review of the existing evidence added to the information that has come to light in more recent years lead to a conviction? Could modern DNA techniques, for example, still provide an answer as to who killed Dr. Robert Oko and why? Well, I mean, with the advancement of DNA and other technology, I mean, if I'd had that at the time, that would have been very helpful indeed. It may have been the missing link where we could have cleared it up altogether. If the will were there, it's highly likely that the Oko case could be solved. But is the will there in today's Kenya? This is where the disfigured body of a popular Kenyan politician was found by a local herdsman one morning many years ago. It was not the body of Robert Oko. It belonged to J.M. Karaoke, who was murdered 15 years earlier. Who killed him and left his corpse here on an anthill at the foot of the Gong Hills has never been established. The names Ooko and Karaoke had a long list of famously unsolved murders that stretched back to Kenya's independence. 
Pio Gama Pinto, Tom Boyer, Father John Kaiser, Ronald Ngala, Kungua Karumba. In this series, we've established beyond doubt that the story we were told for so long as to who killed Dr. Robert Oko and why was wrong. With the latest advances in DNA technology and a properly impartial and diligent investigation into Oko's murder, it might still be possible to identify his killers, to exonerate the innocent, to find the truth. We are living in a more open, freer society than when Robert Oko died. But in one crucial respect, Kenya hasn't changed. We're still a country that is afraid to confront its past. We can't read our history objectively and with our tribal interests put to one side. Remember the warning from history as spoken by the Spanish philosopher George Santayana. Those who don't remember their past are condemned to repeat it. <laughs>